Yeah. Hi, yeah. Adam. 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 Nice to meet you. Good evening. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean sorry to break up a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go ahead and get started so that we're not here too terribly long. Um, I'm Mike Sobel. I'm the district CFO treasurer. Um, the purpose of the meeting tonight and this public forum is not necessarily a levy discussion. It is a, for lack of a better word, school finance 101. Um, it's how schools are funded in Ohio. This is actually taken, this is a stripped down version of a longer lecture that I do. I teach, I lecture at Ohio State in the Glenn School. This is a, this is a stripped down version of that. Um, so, other, so it's not hour long, it get, doesn't get into too much detail. If you do have questions as I'm going along, please ask them. You don't need to wait till the end to ask. Um, we'll cover, there's a bunch of different topics that we're going to be covering. Um, so please feel free to, to interrupt and ask questions as we're going along. Um, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk just a little bit about the basic structure and types of school in Ohio, um, just so you, so you understand the terminology. Um, we're going to look at how the state funding system works, the state share of funding works, how the local share of funding works, and then kind of a little bit on the role of financial forecasts um, that we do. Um, presentation is probably about 20 or 25 minutes. Again, unless you're asking questions, which is great. If you ask questions, that's fine. And it goes longer, that's fine. So in the school district structure, the you know, we, you view us as a public school. There are actually four different types of public schools in Ohio. We are in the third column there, city, exempted village, and local school districts. We're an exempted village school district. Um, Any more that has no special meaning. It, it's a designation that goes back probably 60 or 70 years based on the organizational structure of the village around us. Um, it has no special meaning. It did way back when it did. It does not anymore. Um, there are educational service centers. There are about 40 or 50 of those in the state. They serve wide ranges. There's a Licking County Educational Service Center. What they provide is services for, that, are, that are more cost effective centralized in the county. Um, a lot of it is services for special needs kids um, because each of us individually other than maybe Newark does not necessarily have enough special needs kids to, we're, we're each hiring our own teachers to do that. And so the ESC will do that. They also provide some gifted coordinating services around the county. Um, we have a gifted coordinator who works with us and Valley, is it? In Licking Valley, who works for both districts. So again, we don't have to hire our own coordinator and they don't have to hire theirs. And they, it's a shared services model. And so they're, they're, they are publicly funded um, through a combination of allocations from the state and charges to us for serving us in the service and providing education to our residents. Hey, there, hey Mike, wait, can I yeah. ask a question? Yeah. Is, the, is the, the, the charges that we take for the ESC, is it based on like a, just a base number, like population or number of kids? It's based or? strictly on the services. It so like if we don't, like if we happen to not have any kids that fall into the ESC, we don't get charged? Correct. Okay. Yeah, a big one, like we, believe it or not, people don't realize this, we are responsible for educating preschool students with special needs. Most people don't realize that's a function of public schools. We contract with, the ESC does that for us. Rather than, first of all, we don't have the space to run a pre, for preschool. And we don't necessarily have enough students to be able to run a preschool. And so our charges for the preschool, there, a couple of years ago, we had almost 25 kids in there. Last year, we had 15. This year, I think we're only going to have about 11 or 12. So our charges are lower now than they were two years ago because we have fewer kids that are being served. Okay. Um, joint vocational school districts, there are 48 or 49 of those in the state. That is CTEC. If you know who CTEC is, that is a public school district. Um, Dr. Corman is a board member at CTEC as well as here on our board. Um, and they provide primarily uh, programs and technical, more technical and career oriented services for high school students. They are publicly funded. They get a combination of funding from the state. And then for our students who are going to CTEC, those students count rather than as ours, they count as CTEC students. And so the funding goes them, which includes, we teach some CTEC courses in our high school. 
There are CTEC teachers who are in our high school teaching um, some art programs, teaching um, coding. We're starting a new business entrepreneurship program this year. Those are CTEC teachers in our district. And technically, when our students are taking that class, they are going to CTEC, not to Granville High School. And so CTEC gets to count those kids for funding. And then there are charter schools, and those can be either brick and mortar or online, you know. Obviously the, the big one in the news has been ECOT. ECOT is a public school, or was, when it existed. It was a public school. It is a for-profit school, but it is a public school. And what that means is, by being a public school, the student does not have to pay to go there. The student can go for free. And that, so charter school, whether it's brick and mortar, whether it's online, that means a student does not have to pay to go there. We have to pay, is we get charged by the charter school for every student, every resident of ours going to a charter school or an online school, we have a charge of six, over $6,000 that we pay that is taken from us and is given to the charter school. Um, but they are public schools. Um, talked a little bit about what the ESCs and the JVSs are designed to do, so we'll move on from there. Um, then we talked about the charter schools. Any questions about the different types of public schools? Before This is really all I'm going to talk about, the organizational structure, and we're going to start moving into the financing, and really all we're going to talk about is the financing of local, what are called LEAs, local education local education associations, which is us, the Exemptive Village City, and local schools at this point. So any questions about the, just the, the structure of schools? Okay. Funding in Ohio is a shared responsibility. It's always been a shared responsibility between the state and between uh, the local school districts. And it is a shared responsibility, and the funding is split based on wealth. Basically, the wealthier the community, the less money is coming from the state, the more money is assumed to be coming from the local taxpayers. Um, that many of you may know there was a series of court cases that started in the late 90s, went on through the mid 2000s, collectively known as the Durolf cases. There were Durolf 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, there were four eventually four different lawsuits. In each one of those lawsuits, the, Supreme, the Ohio Supreme Court found the system of funding in Ohio unconstitutional. That it was putting an undue burden on local property taxes, that it was not an equitable distribution. However, after Draw 4, which occurred, I don't know, like 2004 or 5, somewhere in there, I can't remember what year anymore. Um, the Supreme Court once again ruled it unconstitutional and then gave up control of the case. So they, held, they did not impose any solution. They did not no longer review. They basically said, no, it's unconstitutional. You legislature do something to fix it. And that was the end of, of the case because there was no longer judicial review over what was going on 20 years ago. Um, arguably, the legislature has not addressed the, the constitutional issue. But it's, never now, it's now been 12, 14 years since it's been in court. And so we don't really know if it is constitutional or not. I would argue that, or guess it's probably not. Do yes. many states have the same um, model, same structure? Most states have some type of a shared responsibility between the state and the local. Well, there's only one state that has a statewide school, fund, school system, and that's Hawaii. Hawaii has one school district. And the split is generally determined by wealth or not necessarily? Uh, it's going to be all over the place. A lot of times it is based on wealth. Um, and a lot of times it depends on the state, how much the state is putting in, how much the locals are putting in. Um, a lot of that is just historic, how it has been in those states historically. A state like New Hampshire, which has a very weak state government, um, most of the funding is local. There's very minimal funding that comes from the state. Now, probably about 40, I bet about 40 states over the last 30 years have been in this type of litigation. 
um, in in their own supreme within their own court system over the constitutionality of the system. Some are in perpetual. Kansas has been in perpetual um, litigation for years and years. And the Supreme Court keeps ruling it unconstitutional, and the legislature keeps fighting them. And it's been going on there for probably 20 years. Yeah, Fred. And the state determines wealthy district. The state. Right? It's the formula. Air quotes. The state district. formula determines what wealth means. And and what precisely? Well, not precisely, but what generally was unconstitutional. What was, there was a couple different things that were unconstitutional. One was building conditions, and the state actually has dealt with that very well. The state, you know, if you go, there was a there was a documentary that was done back in the mid to late nineties on the conditions of some of the buildings in southeast Ohio. You had kids in buildings with wiring hanging from the system, asbestos coming out of the walls. And the state has put in billions and billions of dollars over the last 20 years to really build new schools around the state. And they've actually done a very nice job of doing that. They put a lot of money in. You, for the most part, do not have kids going to school in those conditions anymore in most places in the state. That is one area the legislature did address in Duralf. And my guess is if the same issue came up again, it would be deemed constitutional. Um, the other issue was over, because of over-reliance on property tax, the opportunity, yeah, a student in Granville has opportunities that a student in rural Southeast Ohio that does not have because of local, because of wealth. Right. We can provide our, and, and the, what the, basically the Supreme Court says is that the accident of where you are born should not be a driver of your educational life opportunities at least out of some basic level. And that, that's really been the main issue um, through all the draw cases. All right, so the school funding. For us as a school district, we have four main sources of funding. We get local tax dollars, schools get local tax dollars. We only get property tax. With any luck, after November, we'll have an income tax too. Um, as you know, we have an issue on the ballot. About 190 districts in the state use income tax, um, which is a, just under a third. There's a little over 600 districts in the state. Um, and so the rest comes from property tax. There is state aid, which is unrestricted state aid. It's grants to us. We can use it for anything part of our operations. Um, there are federal earmarked dollars. Uh, those come for very specific purposes. We get funding for under the IDEA Act, which is Individuals with Disabilities Act, to serve students with disabilities. We get money from Title I, which is to serve lower income students who are behind because they're economically disadvantaged. Those are our two main, there's a couple other small ones. That's where we get most of our federal money. And then there's other local non-tax dollars, and that would be the fee, you know, you guys pay class fees for your kids, um, that would be a, a the biggest example of local non-tax dollars that we get are the fees. Um, and, you know, we earn interest on our investments, so we get money from that. Luckily, we're getting a little more now than we were a couple years ago. Um, but that's a very small part of, of funding. That's the smallest of the, of the four. And like I said, the amount of money that comes locally versus the state is really driven by wealth. And where do you see that? And first of all, if you look across the whole state um, and the, sort, the four sources, you can see that state revenue and local taxes, the blue and the red area, are almost about the same size. So about the same amount of money is coming to schools in aggregate. And this is across all 600 districts in aggregate are coming from those two sources. And then the other is the federal and the other local revenue are both around 7-8% of the total pot. So most money that's coming for operations is coming from one of those two sources, either state unrestricted aid or local property tax payers. To get an idea of what the wealth means, I've got up here examples, Granville and Whitehall. Whitehall is about the same size as we are as far as numbers of students. Um, they are probably in the 20% poorest districts as far as wealth in the state. So they are a low wealth district. 
Um, same about 20, yeah, 2,000, 2,500 kids. And you can see the sources of the, bu of the budget and what it means. So for us, 62% of, of our operating revenue is coming from local taxes. For Whitehall, that number is only 23%. They're getting 60% of their funding from the state because they are not a wealthy district. They are a poor school district, so they are getting a bigger share of revenue from the state. We're getting not quite 30%. This, this day is a year too old at this point, but it hasn't changed. It, it's not changed. But this is giving you an idea of how the state splits what's coming from the state versus what we are paying locally. Great. Yeah, Mike. Um, the shape of our pie, how much has that changed over the past 10, 15 years? Um, it has probably, the state share has probably been declining. Um, and the reason it's been declining is we are getting about the same amount of money. I think we're getting about one, per, or I think it was about 2% more money right now from the state than we got 10 years ago. So we're, we're essentially had the same amount of money from the state for 10 years. In that interim, we've passed two, levy, two new levies. We, you know, so our overall revenue has gone up, but the state hard dollars have stayed the same, which means the state percentage has gone down. So over time, yeah, it's more and more burden has been shifted onto, um, onto the local taxpayers. And again, this is also a function of wealth to some degree. You see our federal share is 2.2%. Whitehall's is a, almost 12% of theirs is coming from the feds. And that's Title I money. They are, since they have a very high percentage of economically disadvantaged students, they get a lot more Title I money then we get Title I money um, for those that, to deal with economically disadvantaged kids. Yeah, John. You referenced the amount of money that we received 10 years ago versus today. What about the requirements of that money? Um, maybe what I would categorize as unfunded mandates. In that 10 year period, there, you know, there are certain unfunded mandates we can pick out and, and be able to determine what, it's easy to see how much we spent 10 years ago and how much we spend now. And our unfunded mandates have increased over 100%. The amount of money that we spent has increased over 100% in the last 10 years. At the same time that we've gotten about 2% more money from the state. And those mandates are probably are primarily coming from the state and from the federal government. Um, and, and so we are, we are having a lot more spending on stuff that we're required by the state and the feds to spend money on and we're not getting commensurate money to go with that, which means that money is coming from local taxpayers. Yeah. In, in terms of actual dollars, how does Whitehall compare to us? Um, it's probably, in to aggregate, their spending is probably a little bit lower. But it's um, in the same ballpark? It's, because they're a similar, they're a similar size district, yeah. so yeah, they're, it's gonna be similar. They're probably a little bit less because we do generate a lot of money from our property taxes. Yeah. Um, and so it's probably an aggregate a little bit lower. Um, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that much different because the relative size of the districts are the same. Okay. Yeah, Jim. Can you talk a little bit about how like actually local taxes are made up from two sources? Lo business and residential? Yeah, local, so local tax, there, there's a the property tax that applies to all property. Um, Whitehall probably, they probably get a higher percentage of their taxes from business than we do. They've got some business areas in Whitehall that we don't have, um, as others do. We get a very high percentage of our revenue from residential taxpayers. Um, we get almost 90% of our revenue out of taxes from local taxpayers. The average around the state is about 75 um, of what comes from the, from home, essentially homeowners or what, yeah, it's called class one, which is residential and agricultural taxpayers. So we are much heavily skewed towards the residential portion. Um, with one, one of the problems that we have with, the, with our system is where, because there's a lot of reliance on local taxes and local property taxes to fund schools, especially as districts got wealthier, you know, that's a big source, but for the most part, state law prevents that revenue from growing as values grow. So your largest, essentially our largest source of revenue, 62% of our revenue, 
for the most part, is not allowed to grow with inflation. And so what that, of course, makes it hard to do is keep up with inflation because our costs do go up with inflation, or really even probably a little bit faster than inflation because of our mandated spending and, and things like that. And so if our local taxes can't grow with inflation, and over 10 years we've gotten about 2% more money from the state, which is about 2 tenths of a percent per year, and so now you're looking at 90% of our revenue can't grow and or isn't growing. And so that's what puts pressure on districts like ours that force us to come back to the ballot every five years, give or take, to ask more for more money is to meet the inflationary costs that we're facing on the expenditure side. The only way that we can get new revenue is from new construction. A new home is built, we do get new revenue in that. New business comes in, you have Middleton, the Middleton over on South Cherry, when that opened up, yes, we got a, we got a nice chunk of new money from that when that opened up, because it came on as new construction. As values grow like they did at the reappraisal last year, where residential values around the district grew a little under 14% across all residential values, we got about 1.5% growth in revenue out of that 14%. And so we're, we're not allowed to capture growth with, again, as values grow because of inflation. Um, and where you, you can see where this happens and the effect of this in this slide. Um, this is looking at our valuation and t tax rate changes over time. And how this works is you see the number circled, which is last year. So because of the reappraisal, in our real property, we had we got $59 million of new valuation in the district. But because of the way the tax system works, our residential tax rates were reduced by over four mills. And so the purpose of reducing the millage is to keep the tax revenue the same as the valuations grow. Um, and so that's what that looks like. And you can see out in 2020 when we'll have a triennial update, which comes three years after the reappraisal. And here I'm projecting that we're going to get about $37 million of additional value to do that triennial update. But again, you can see I'm expecting that our tax rates will go down about 1.8 mils again. And again, so that when that value goes up, the tax rates are reduced, so we're not getting any more money from that additional valuation that's due to the reappraisal. So what this creates is something that's called a levy cycle. Um, and so what a levy cycle does is you pass a levy, and this is a, this is a pretty good example of, of uh, the last levy cycle. Um, if you remember, we passed the levy in November of 2013. And so if you go back to fiscal year 15, which would have been the year that started July 1st, 2014, you can see that we took in the second line from the bottom, $1.7 million more in revenue than we spent. And so we are running up. I haven't done that in about a year. <laughs> <laughs> I had a real bad habit of doing that at seminars we ran last year. So I'm really too bad in sending my water bottle flying. Um, you can see we ran about a $1.7 million surplus, and then in 16, we ran about a $600,000 surplus. And so what's happening is you pass the levy, revenue's coming in faster than the expenditures are growing. But remember, revenues aren't growing very fast. And again, if you look at our revenues, you're seeing very small growth amounts from 15 to 16 to 17. By 17, we have now started spending more than we're taking in. That means we're now on the downside of the levy cycle. Um, you know, it's pretty basic math. If you're spending more than you're taking in, you can only do that so long before you run out of money. It's no different from us than it would be in your household budget. If you start spending money more than you're taking in, you start spending down your savings account. At some point, that savings account's not going to be there anymore to spend. And so as, the rep, as we go through the cycle and through this, the um, levy cycle, we need to have an infusion of new money or we need to cut expenditures. Um, we did not get an infusion of money in May, so we cut expenditures. 
um, to offset to offset some of that. And that's how the cycle that's how the levy cycle works. The thing with an income tax is an income tax is allowed to grow with inflation. As it as incomes are growing, it generates more money. It slows down this levy cycle because now we can start getting growth in our revenue. And that's one of the reasons why we have looked at an income tax and think it's a good long-term um, solution for the district as far as coming up with finance. What the levy cycle does is this. This is our levy history, our levy history back to 1976 of all of our new levies. And you can see that, yeah, we were, yeah, in 19, it didn't, that does not mean we passed a new levy of 22 mills in 1976. <laughs> that was when the current system came into effect and that's the accumulation of all the levies that had passed prior to 1976, or in that's what's called the 1976 levy. And so you can see we have been on the ballot for additional money anywhere from every two to eight years. Um, we were, you see back in 92, 93, 95, that was coming out of the recession in the 90s. Um, and there was a lot of state budget cuts back then. You see we had new levies three times in four years. Um, and, and then others you can see generally four to spread, spread out four to five years um, in general. But that's what a levy cycle looks like and that's what it does. Is the levy cycle forces the district back to the ballot every, you know, for us it's been three to seven years depending on the financial conditions um, over the last 40 years. Looking at overall revenue and spending, and, and this is getting back to, to the kind of the end of the state, the state funding. In the 16-17 school year, which is the last year there's data across the state for, we spent about $11,600 per pupil. Um, that's basically everything except for what we pay for debt service and any building construction. And we did have a, a building construction project that was going on at that time where we were retrofitting all the lights and putting a new roof on the intermediate school and things like that. The base funding amount that year from the state was $6,000 per pupil. And what the $6,000 is a per pupil funding, what that's defined as, is basically it's an estimate, not based on anything, I will tell you. It, it has no real basis. Is that's how much it costs to educate a quote unquote typical student. A typical student meaning a student with no special needs at all. They're not, they don't have any developmental problems, they're not economically disadvantaged, they're not gifted, just a typical student. And that in the fiscal 17, that was $6,000. The generous state in the, the current budget, in t last fiscal year, the 18th fiscal year, that amount was 6,010. And this year it is 6,020. <laughs> so we, we had gotten an extra $10 a pupil from the state. Of course, because of our wealth, we only, the 6,000 is actually a shared amount. Is the 6,000 is how much they think it costs to educate a typical student. Because of our wealth, two thirds of that amount actually is expected to come from our local taxpayers. So of that 6,000, the state pays us about 2,000 and you pay 4,000. So when you think about that, so of that $10 that the state says it now costs 60, 10 to educate, they only gave us $3.33 of that 10 and the other $6.67 you're paying for each of those years. And that's how the funding system works. There are a lot of add-ons to this base amount. There are weights for students with special needs. There are weights for students who are economically disadvantaged. There's additional funding for gifted. There is funding to help with the third grade reading guarantee. There is some supplemental funding based on your ability to raise taxes from a wealth standpoint locally. Believe it or not, we don't get any of that. Um, we don't get it. We don't get any equalization money to because it's hard for us to raise money locally from what from a mill. Uh, we also, from economic disadvantage, students with economic disadvantage, we get about $300 a year from the state in economic disadvantage money. 
we do get a chunk of special education money for students with special education, but that's also subject to the welfare variable. So if the state determines that it costs $15,000 for a student with this handicap addition above the $6,000, they give us $3,000 of that, or $5,000 of that $15,000. The local taxpayers come up with the other $10,000 um, because that is shared based on our ability to raise money locally as well. Emily? Yeah. If we don't offer that service here, we're paying for students to go to other schools. In that's correct. And that's a huge portion. It is, that is correct. And we did, and I, I don't know if we talked about this before it came in about the ES, what the ESCs do, the educational service centers. So yeah, student, a lot of students with severe, with severe handicaps, they're educated through the ESC because they're better set up to educate students with severe problems than we are. And we pay, we pay about $25,000, give or take, for each student with a, handy, with a severe handicap that the ESC is educating on our behalf. And so we will pay them 20, it's roughly $25,000 for that. More if they require a one to one aid. That's assuming they don't have a one to one aid. If they have a one to one aid, it's probably more like $50,000. But not everything is a severe handicap. There are students that we're paying for. It. Right. The ones without, a lot of the ones who don't aren't severely handicapped, we are educating ourselves. It, it's just we don't have the facilities, um, and it's not cost effective. For uh, you know, we only have two or three students with severe handicaps. That may not be, you know, for us to provide a teacher to do that may not be cost effective. The ESC can take R3 and Downstown's two and we can get like four. Mm -hmm. She's talking about Marburg. Oh, Marburg? Or other schools like Yeah, Marburg is different. Yeah. I am talking about Marburg. Yeah, Marburg is different. I knew. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there are things what, called, there's a program called John Peterson Scholarships that students with special needs can take. And they can take those, they will get an allocation that comes from us to go to a private school that provides the services they need. Marburn has an autistic program, primarily an autistic program. So students with autism. Dyslexic. Oh, dyslexic. And dyslexic, okay. So they're and, straight up private. Hmm? They're private. They're private. Got it. And our scholarship costs will generally range, based on the severity, could be anywhere from ten to $27,000. For, for each of those students that so, comes from us. And that is parent choice, not? Yes, that is parent choice. But they have to fight for that, don't they have to? No. no. So they can just say, this is what the psychologist said, and then, but John Peterson isn't state money, or it's part state, part us? It's all us. We, they count as one of our students, so we get $2,000 from the state, and we may get some, 33, a third of the you know, of their handicap money, mm -hmm. but we have to send out 100% of the cost. So in essence, the state pays us about a third of what we then turn around and pay to, whether it's Marburn or one of the other schools that's providing the service. And it's strictly parent choice. Mm -hmm. they, they, they take that. But there has to be a need. It's not like a- There has, yes. There has to be, has to be there does have to be a big diagnosis. Yeah, mm -hmm. a diagnosis. And, and is there any Medicaid offset money for any of that? We not for us. There's not. But but to the to the people who are educating, there would be. Again, or not for us because we're a rich. Because district. of what? Okay. There are other other districts. There are districts that get hundreds of thousands of dollars in Medicaid dollars to offset some of these costs. We have looked into it. It's probably going to cost us more to deal with all the paperwork and everything involved in qualifying for the Medicaid dollars mm -hmm. than we'd actually end up getting right. in Medicaid dollars because of the wealth of the industry. Because Medicaid is strictly a wealth based program. Right. Yeah, Mike. Above our total budget, the students we're talking about right now, what percent do they consume? Yeah. I want to say that's a hard question. It's not that hard a question. It's not a question I have that I know. Of. It's not an answer I have off the top of my head. But I know. Is it like one percent? Oh no no no! It's it's probably 
is between 10 and 20 percent of our overall spending. Are you talking special needs or are you talking Marburn? Special needs. Special needs in general. In, in, in aggregate. The okay. Marburn. The Marburn but not gifted. We're just the, talking on the other. Correct. Okay. The, the cost that we have for scholarships, I'm trying to remember, I think it was around 200. You did the deductions. It's like $250,000 or so that we charge off each year for Mark, for Peterson and autism. I think it was around two hundred fifty. Flexes every month. Yeah, I think, about, I think it was around two hundred fifty thousand dollars last year. It was for nineteen students, I think. It, it was two hundred fifty some thousand dollars for nineteen students, which would be that would be about just for those nineteen kids would be about probably over one percent of our total spending just on that one that one line item. What do districts? What, what would a district like Whitehall do? Like, do they have the resources to do that? Well, first of all, because they're probably more like a 60 or 70 percent state funded district, is they'll get 60 or 70 percent of the funding right. from the state where we get 33, but they still get the same, the deduction is identical for them as it is for us. If a student takes an autism scholarship, yeah, if they're on the autism spectrum, severe enough that they qualify for an autism scholarship, that scholarship is $27,000. And it's $27,000, whether it's one of our students who takes it, or one of Whitehall students, or Newark, it doesn't matter who it is. The difference is, we may get paid $9,000 of that from the state, they may get paid $18,000 of it from the state. Right. And so there's less of it coming out of their local right. resources, but the cost is the cost. Right. right. These scholarships are state program. They are state pro they are state mandated programs, yes. So so let's say of the students that we're sending out of the district to get services, if that's costing roughly ten to twenty percent of our total budget, um, has that percentage increased? That, the past 10 years. that has that is the line item in the budget that has grown over 100 percent over the last 10 years. Because that those are the state and federal mandated services that if someone needs a service, we have we then we should. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. we should be providing the service if the federal if the service is mandated to us, then we pay the cost of the service. But that's part of some of the discussions in earlier meetings where the cost has increased so yes. much. Yep. That, that, that is by far the fastest growing line in our budget mm -hmm. over the last 10 years has been has been that line. And is that called purchase services on the budget? The it's all per, it's all yeah it is almost exclusively in purchase. To some degree it's wow. not is there you know the not you know people who have, who have special needs but are not so severe, we have to send them elsewhere that we do educate them within the district. That has been growing as well. So it's it's not only purchase services. We do see some of it in more inter, you know, more intervention specialists that we have to meet because our percentage of students with needs has been increasing um, over the last five to seven years. Can I ask a question to you guys? Because I'm sure that you guys have had incredibly long, detailed discussions about this. Um, what's the what's the general consensus? Like, what do you guys like? Like, what does the board in general think about? Like, are there are there things that you guys have talked about and thought about as alternatives, or are there really just more? You know, alternatives to. I, I I don't know. Like, I mean, you guys are so like. You guys are incredible, first of all, and, and you're so deep on all of these issues that I'm curious if you guys have any kind of texture to bring to the conversation. It's really, and we'll, we'll you think about this, but no, it's not optional. Right. It's required. So it really is a binary choice. Do we pay someone to do it or we do it ourselves and take it in-house? And we don't have this, this capability to space the physical facilities, even if we could staff it adequately to do it ourselves. Um, and it, 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 Mike said it's you know the largest um, unregulated expense right. uh, that we have, and one that's it's not at all within our control. Um, there, for just the way that the way that it works is there's, there's um, 
you know, it is parent choice. It is it, the basis is the diagnosis, and and so the cost is the cost. And so it's an area where we feel like we can do a lot and have done a lot to control other expenses. This is one that we've not been able to impact. And and you know I think there are others. Mr. Brown and Mr. Sobel could probably speak to it. Can it's, also hard. it's also difficult to forecast, right? Because right. we don't know year to year. Right. And, um, and go ahead. I'm sorry. Right. Go ahead. I mean, and it's not like we don't think students don't deserve these services. Just it being a state mandated program, it would be nice if the state actually funded it. it, it, it is there, it, if it, in a perfect world, if you had unlimited funding and you were able to provide this service, are you still mandated by the state to provide to, to provide student choice, even though you're able to provide yes. the yes. services? Yes, okay. and that's choice. the challenge. That, that's that's, that's going to be my point. Yeah. Okay. And and Adam, you know the me the service delivery method that we use is the most cost effective. It would cost us more to try and do it to in try and do it ourselves mm -hmm. yeah. than to use essentially the ESC consortium, right? Because because they have some economies of scale. That we don't have, right, and so this is yeah. It's an expensive service. If we try to do it ourselves, it would be even a more expensive service to give the same service that we're giving right now. It sounds yeah. like a, that you're just in the perfect storm of the funding model, then, right? I mean, it's a great school district. It's attracting families. Um, I think also, of, especially of kids who have some learning disabilities right. who want to provide the right future, but then. They know or they don't know that you know the state's not providing this district as right. much as it's providing to others. Yeah, and yeah, we do have a reputation. I deserve. We do a great job of educating all students, and that does attract. You're right, and that we and we have seen that in our numbers, where our percentages of students with special needs have been increasing um, over the last five years. But I, I think the primary conversation has been around students with special needs, but there are a lot of other services that are mandated that are driving these costs to escalate. And so what I, what I say to the General Assembly is, you're putting drops in the top of the bucket, but you're poking about 15 holes in the bottom of the bucket. So you're not, you're not replacing anywhere close to the costs that you are requiring. And, and those costs can be in professional development requirements, uh, you know, there was a law that was passed two years ago that required us to do 60 hours of professional development for students with gifted services, hmm. for kids that have gifted services needs. That's 60% of our population. We do that all the time, okay? But that requirement of 60 hours makes us have to shift and potentially provide something more and additional that, that really there's no research base beyond, you know, supporting that need. So. There are a lot of other things beyond what we've just been talking about that, that happen at the level of, of the General Assembly that they just say, well, they'll do it. Um, House Bill 410, the attendance issue. We do not have a, uh, an attendance issue in, in Granville schools. Truancy it's come, issue. What's that? It's a truancy issue. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a truancy issue. But we're required to go through all these plans and send letters to parents and, and do all these requirements that eat up staff personnel time, and it's not an issue that we have. So a lot of times, one size fits all policy has a uh, a negative impact that on our bottom line, our budget. And I could probably list off twenty of those. Yeah, I mean, we, our reporting to the state through our what's called EMIS, which is the state reporting system. When I started here seven years ago, we had. A part, one of my part-time, one of my full-time employees spent a little bit of her time doing that. We had another person who came in for a little bit of time at certain heavy times of the year. Now we have a full-time staff person who does that is her job, is doing what we have to report to the state, and it's really it's more than one it's really more than one person's job. And she spends a, a ton of time, and that's a full-time position just to report everything we have to report to the state. Because if we don't do it right, we don't get funded for it. So, you know, a little bit on my soapbox here, but if you layer onto those issues, legitimate funding issues with services that cost money and, and are warranted, 
then you layer on losses of revenue and diversion of funds from public schools to public charter schools that don't have similar transparency and reporting requirements, that don't have similar um, examinations of their rigor or of their attendance, as we saw last year, where God only knows how many tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars have been siphoned away, lost, and won't, won't be back. And that was only discovered at that one entity with a special audit, right? But the state doesn't otherwise look at that. And that money gets siphoned out of the public school system all, all day long. So there's a, there, we get pushed at both ends. All right. This is just a quick example. I explained the 33%. You can see for the last three years, including this year, the, the core funding amounts that the state says. And you can see we get about a, a third of that from the state. So you know, in core aid, we're getting about not quite $5 million a year from the state. In total, we're getting about $6.4 million from the state. So the difference between the 4.9 and the 6.4 is additional funding for students with special needs for a, get a little bit of economic disadvantage, the funding we get for the third grade reading guarantee, funding for transportation, which has been cut over the last two years for wealthy school districts. Um, we, we are, we've actually, by this year, we've lost 50% of the funding for transportation compared to what we got in 2017 um, because of funding cuts that the state has made for the wealthiest school districts, which we are among them. Um, and so we've lost, yeah, we've lost state aid, state aid and transportation in that area. Since when? I'm sorry. Hmm. Fifty percent. Well, since actually, when? it's not fifty. It's, I take it back. It's not fifty. It's thirty-three. We lost thirty-three percent from 2017 to 2019. We we in 2017 we got about six hundred thousand dollars of transportation aid from the state. This year we're getting under four hundred thousand dollars of transportation aid from the state even though we are transporting the same number of students, probably a few more students than we were two years ago, but we're getting a third less funding from the state because of our wealth. Mike, excuse me. I mean, when you say wealth, that, that is the state determining Correct. that we have the ability Correct. to pay that. Now well, it's up to it's up to the community. That is correct. To, well, to pay for it. It is strictly wealth based. It does not. It is not impacted by whether you do or don't vote for right. levy mm -hmm. or how much levy you have. It's not based on effort. It's strictly based on the abil the relative ability of our district to raise money locally, relative to the ability of the other six hundred and nine districts in the state. Okay to raise money locally based on their wealth. And so it's, it's the state share index is what drives it. Our state share index right now is about 33%, meaning so that we get, more, you know, whatever the state says should be spent, they give us a third, local taxpayers come up with two thirds. And that's principally driven by property value, not by income. It is primarily driven by property value um, relative income wealth can help you, but it does not hurt you in the formula. So districts, and it, it's kind of a weird way, it, the, there's a weird way it's kind of done. And it doesn't quite have the impact you would think would happen. I don't want to get into that. Mm -hmm. The wealth, income does not come into our formula at all. Because income would make us wealthier. And so if it makes you wealthier, it does not penalize you in the formula. It can only benefit you. So the way we get more money from the state is to become poorer. There's two ways to become poorer, and one of it is one of them is actually really counterintuitive. You can become poorer by losing property value, losing property wealth, which makes sense. Yep, you lose wealth, you're poorer. You also become poorer by gaining students. Huh. Because everything is done on a valuation per pupil. That is actually helping us. That's why we went from 31.7 to 33.4. That is because we have grow this growing enrollment. The state as a whole loses about 
half a percent to three quarters of a percent of students per year. So the statewide trend is a very slow negative. And remember, we're compared to the other 609 districts. So if we're gaining enrollment, we are be even if we don't gain, yeah, we are becoming poorer by gaining enrollment because our value per pupil is coming down. And that's what's reflected in that little bit of a bump between 2017 and 2018 is the fact that we gain students. So that's how you become poor. Um, unfortunately, we are really right now, because of the 14% reappraisal last year, we're becoming wealthier. Um, and when that eventually gets into the formula, assuming the formula is still in place next year, any luck it won't be, but that, if it's still in place, then we are going to get wealthier um, next year, which means that 33.4% is going to drop, um, probably somewhere down close to 30. And that will mean we get less money from the state, at, at least for each, on a per pupil basis. Um, oh, and there's, okay, and there's my fourth. That, that's at least a version of the forecast. I don't know if that's the current version. But you can see, because of the big jump in our valuation, I, at that, when I did this slide, I was projecting our state <coughs> percentage would drop down actually to 29 next year. That doesn't seem like a lot of drop from 33 to 29. That doesn't sound that big. But when you put it in percentage change terms, that's over a 10% drop in the state share index. That is a very big drop. Um, you know, four percentage points divided by 33.4 is a very big percentage drop, and it will have a very significant impact um, on our per pupil funding. And so we do five-year forecasts. Um, some of you have seen my presentation. If those of you who haven't came back to see this, I, I don't know if I applaud you or <laughs> you. Um, we do five-year forecasts twice a year. Right now they're due May 31st and October 31st. Um, there was a lot changed, one of the bills that was passed um, in that last month um, that moves the date of the October to November, but because the governor didn't sign the bill till November 3rd, it doesn't take effect till November, I mean didn't sign it till August 3rd. It doesn't take effect until November 1st, the day after the filing deadline this year. And so we still have the October 31st deadline this year. We'll have a November 30th deadline next year. Um, the purpose of the forecasts technically are a monitoring ability by ODE, for ODE to, mon to monitor the fiscal capability. If you're doing the forecast seriously, which we do very seriously, it is a planning document. Yep. It, is one of our, it is our main financial planning document, and that is what we use it for. Um, and so we do take it very seriously um, in doing the forecast and how we're looking at it. And it helps us with staffing. It helps us managing the district from a financial standpoint. Yeah, Jeff? How often does the state budget? It's the, a two-year budget. The budget is a two-year budget. We have to forecast five years, do the math. We don't really know what the last three years of the forecast cast for our second biggest source of revenue looks like. Um, we're making educated guesses um, based on if the current formula stays in place and kind of what happens. Um, yeah, we have to forecast what's happening in every district in the state to know our relative wealth. Luckily, I, I used to be responsible for that when I was with the state um, before I retired. And so I actually do that. And for my, I have a business that we do software to do this, and there's about 250 school districts that actually use my forecasts of all the state variables in doing that forecast. I tell them, you, may, you can use mine and then just blame me when your forecasts are wrong, every, so which is fine. Um, <laughs> but we do have, but you, but you see there's the uncertainty that's built into that, um, is that we have to know what's going on in the, across the entire state to know how it's affecting us, not just what's going on in Granville. And formulas change with each governorship. They have over the last 10 years. That was not the case for many, many years. But yeah, we are now on our fourth formula since 2009. For, for you mean the, the wealth formula? The, the state, wealth well, formula. the state, 
how the state aid is calculated, okay. not just both, the whole. The whole thing. Yeah, and honestly, I hope it changes again. Um, You've alluded to this a couple of times. Is there reason to think that it will? There is a task. There is a task force that has been working with the House of Representatives um, since the first of the year, um, made up of treasurers and superintendents and legislators. Um, I have been sort of staffing that. I'm not actually formally on the on any of the subcommittees, but I have been working with almost all of the subcommittees in designing a new state funding formula um, and state local shares. Um, with some luck, it might go somewhere. I'm not holding my breath. Um, but we're taking it seriously in the hopes that maybe it will. So this is our simplified five-year forecast. You saw a bigger piece of this in an earlier slide. This is what our five-year forecast looks like. Um, well, it's what it looked like in May. It's not what it looks like right now, because right now we're forecasting 23, 2023 because mm -hmm. We're in a new fiscal year from where we were. This is what it looked like in May. Um, you can see, again, we're spending more than we're taking in. After next year, after this year, well, this year, that amount starts growing. How much more we're taking in, than we're spending, than we're taking in. And if we don't do anything, you know, showing we're going to be out of money um, at the end of the 2021 school year. What the Department of Education is looking at is they're looking at this and saying, Okay, do you have a plan for this? It's still three years away. Do you have a plan for it? If we were in a situation where that negative number was two years earlier, we would be into something called fiscal caution or fiscal watch. If it's in your current year, you're in fiscal emergency, at which point the state is actually running your school district. The state is now financially running the district. And make, making all your, they appoint a commission that makes all your decisions for you. The board is a rubber stamp at that point. Um, there's a good, it's a really good plan to not get there. <laughs> you really don't want to be in fiscal emergency. Um, we are not in any of those right now. If we don't pass a levy and don't make enough cuts, we probably will be in fiscal caution next year um, because our negative cash balance would only be two years away. Um, yeah, Russ? Mike, could you address for a moment how our fiscal planning and, and Amount that we have budgeted before we <coughs> go into the, into the red impacts our borrowing costs, our rating, uh, ratings from the rating agencies, it, our ability to refinance debt. It, it, it does affect it. They're, they're looking at five year forecasts, they're looking at our long term stability, they're looking at how successful we are with levies. Um, luckily, at this point, we aren't really anticipating going out and borrowing. Um, I refinanced all of our debt about two and a half years ago. Um, so it can't be refinanced again. We still had a, real, a pretty good rating back then. We saved about three and a half million dollars of debt service payments over a 14 year period when we refinanced a couple years ago. Um, but yeah, you can basically, we do get rated every year, either formally or through an informal review. And if the rating agencies see those red, red areas getting closer, they will downgrade us. Um, on our debt and what that means is if at some point we do have to go out and do borrowing to do something It will increase our borrowing costs Do they get nervous about the fact that we're in deficit or do they only get nervous about the final balance? Number? They will look at your history okay. since we have a good history of being able to pass a levy as We've gotten into this situation. They will take that into account. They will also take into account that we've done a good job when we're facing deficits of adjusting our spending if we have to. You know, as we did coming into this year, mm -hmm. as we did back in 2012 coming out of um, the recession, where, you know, we've shown we will make cuts necessary to, to push out our long-term problems. And that actually, that actually helps. The fact that we have a stable board and have had the same superintendent and treasurer now for seven years, that actually helps because we have a history, they have a history with us. Um, so that all goes into the rating. One of the things that on those phone calls that I think is one of the first questions that they ask is, what's your cash reserve? You know, and 
and they know that as a public entity, it's a challenge to keep money in the bank uh, because we get challenged by the community to not do that. And um, they have always required us to try and keep more in the bank than what we do. And um, those are things that I know I heard in the levy conversations about, you know, why do you have $3 million in the bank? Well, we, we operate a $30 million budget. That's not a lot of revenue. It's not a lot of money in the bank when you're thinking about it in the context of a $30 million budget. Mm -hmm. um, and the rating agencies would... They, the rating agencies ideally would like us to have a 33% balance. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they would like to see us on a $30 million budget have $10 million. So would we. In the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. the community, not so much. Um, but that's what the, rate, the rating agency, the districts that are rated higher than us, if we have a high rating, there are higher ratings. The ones rated higher are ones that have 30 and 50% balances in their operating budgets, um, which is, it's hard to do. You know, it's hard to get there. Especially in a district like ours, it's hard to get there. Um, a little, yeah, I, I talked a little bit about the fiscal caution, fiscal much, fiscal emergency. Again, Ideally, you don't want to be in any of those, especially you don't want to be in fiscal emergency um, because it's just really bad things happen when you're in fiscal emergency as far as being forced to do things you may not want to do as a, as a board or a community. And so the, the key takeaways, um, the top one is really more from the parts of the, pr of the presentation that I cut out of here from the left here is, we do have much less autonomy, autonomy than other types of local governments do as far as what we can and can't do. Um, we're on funding cycles. And really the bottom one, we are the only type of government that has state-sponsored competitors that, that compete for the money that we have and compete for the people that we serve. And they are funded by the state. Um, so, and that is a challenge. Luckily, that, I mean, it's not as big a challenge for us as it is some districts. They're, some of the big urban districts have more of their residents going to charter schools than they have going to their own schools. Um, and it's a, much bigger, it's a much bigger issue. But it is, it's an issue, you know, in, at some level it's an issue for all, for all schools. Do charter schools get the pull from property tax? No. How do they, how do they pay for their students? Do they get 100% of that funding? Yep. yep. So they get 100, totally non-deducted, just like Correct. 6,000. Well, what, what yes. happens is, the, the way it works, so let's say, luckily, we did not have a single kid going to ECOT last year when it folded, which is great. Do we have any going to Digital Academy? We do. We have a, few going, a couple of going to Digital Academy. So the way that works is, you know, if they're going to, say they're going to Digital Academy and they're a regular ed student, so they're not, you know, so, we get funded for them. They count as in our funding, yeah, towards the six thousand dollars. The state gives us two thousand dollars. Then the state turns around and gives the digital academy six thousand dollars for that student and takes six thousand dollars away from us. So they give us two thousand dollars and then take six thousand away from us. And so New York Digital Academy, or if it's New York Digital, whatever digital academy it is. They get six thousand dollars for each of those students, and then if the student has special needs, they will get the waiting for the special need, whatever that special need is. Um, and again, if they have the special need, the state will pay us thirty-three percent of what that weight is, and then take away a hundred percent and give it to the digital academy. Yeah, we we don't have any kids who go to a brick and mortar. Um, charter. charter school. All, all the kids that we have going to charter schools are going to um, e some version of an e-school. Um, we don't, you know, there's no, there aren't any real brick and mortar charter schools near us. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, yeah, we don't have that. But that, but that's how they get funded, is they get the full $6,010 plus any appropriate weighting for each of the students that they educate. Um, and that's where their money comes from. Because they, they are not allowed to charge the parents uh, for going there because they're a public school. 
that is it. Um, I will be happy to answer any questions. Yes. You talked about being on a task force or hoping for a new state funding model soon. I was just, I'm sure it would be its own presentation, but I was curious, you know, what are ideally, what would it is, state it funding look like for you? It has not been a secret that it has been under the radar. Mm -hmm. uh, the meetings that we have held are, you know, the general meetings are public meetings, but they're not widely publicized. They have not been covered in the press, um, which is fine. Um, we have not released publicly any simulations of what the news thing, that's intentional. Yeah. Um, where it's at the stage right now, it's rapid. Yeah, we've been working since the first of the year. Um, so it's been going on now for about eight months. Um, I know the representative, the two representatives who are leading the effort are um, Bob Cup, who's a Republican, used to be on the state Supreme Court, um, is a Republican House member from up around Lima, and John Patterson, who is a Democrat from Ashtabula County, is retired. Um, got high school history teacher. Um, they, are both, they are the chair and the ranking member of the House Education Finance Subcommittee. Um, and they have been kind of running it. Representative Ryan, our representative, has been involved with it um, because he's now chair of the House Finance Committee. He was vice chair when we started. So he has been involved as well as several other legislators from both parties. Um, it's, there's eight subcommittees. Um, may, each subcommittee is made up of a superintendent and a treasurer um, in each of them. And then there are a couple of other folks like myself who I've been working probably with six of the eight subcommittees help as far as helping them formulate things and doing research and putting together what things should look like. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be meetings soon with the caucuses of both parties in both houses, and at some point there will be meetings with both gubernatorial candidates um, to talk about the efforts of the, the subcommittee. I think the hope is that we will have a public report. Um, I think the hope is maybe sometime next month. Um, that's a little fluid right now. Uh, so, but it, it's ongoing. The people working on it are taking it seriously. Yeah, goes anywhere. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. This is the fourth one of these I've been involved in in the last 25 years. Okay. Um, the first three never got anywhere, um, which is why I'm not holding my breath. Um, but we're taking it seriously as if it was going to. So we'll see. Yeah. And again, we, this is this has not been in papers. It's not been widely publicized. That has been intentional mm -hmm. um, to try and, but it, but it's not been done in secret either. Yeah, it's, it, it hasn't been done in secret. Okay, thank you all for coming out tonight. If you do have questions, feel free to email me or get in touch with me or Jeff or one of the board members. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thank so this was.